as a quick intro, I'm, I'm actually not sure where to start with this episode. I think this is a, a very, very important topic. Uh, Joker Stant is the guest, and he and I have a, a conversation that's really about normalizing emotion and normalizing how we process and how we think about and how we talk about emotion, especially for middle-aged men. And some of the loneliness, the isolation, the feeling alone in, in all of our problems, if we're not able to do that, as well as a whole laundry list of reasons, we might not be able to do that. We might not be good at that, going both to, to skill set, to uh, core pieces of masculine identity, to just opportunities for those conversations, for uh, thinking about and talking about and processing. And we get a bit into, into mental health as well. Now, I, I will say that neither of us are mental health professionals. And really, this is just from the point of view of two guys in their 50s thinking about life and thinking about where they are in the world. And so it is a, a very generalized conversation. This does not apply to everybody. But as we look around and think about maybe some of the trends that we are seeing, and thinking about what what's you know our own lives, our friends' lives, the the, the people that we see and know around us, and anyway, it's a, a great conversation. I think it's a very important conversation. I'd love to hear your thoughts and, and your feedback, and of course, you you can always uh, re respond on, on Instagram or or simply email at midlifemasterypodcast at gmail dot com. I uh, would love to to hear some maybe some of your thoughts on the topic. And uh, yeah, let's go from there. Let's get started. All right. So today's guest is Joe Gerstant and very, very excited to have Joe on. Known Joe for, for several years now. And um, jo Joe thinks deeper about things than, than most of us do. And so, Joe, I'm excited to benefit from your thoughts and your wisdom today. And but let me ask, um, how do you how do you introduce yourself? Uh, gosh, I don't know that I have a, a, a solid answer to that. It kind of depends on where I'm at and what I'm doing. Uh, my name is Joe Gerstin. I live in Omaha, Nebraska. I have two kids. I'm self-employed. I and um, for a living, I basically do workplace diversity and inclusion work. I'm 52 year old, straight white male. I'm a Taurus. How's that? Is that enough? <laughs> sure, sure. That that, that, that kind of sums it up, maybe. Yeah. So, and, and nothing wrong with being a Taurus. Uh, in fact, that's probably the best, you know, if you're going to go by astrological <laughs> signs. Um, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And, you know, not what we're talking about today, but I, I always love that, that uh, you know, I've heard you introduce yourself that way before. Similar, you know, straight white male doing diversity work. What got you interested in diversity, in diversity work itself? Uh, there's not a short, easy, simple answer to that, uh, but I'll try to, I'll try to sum it up. Um, I, I think what, what really made it happen was I went out into the world and I bumped into people that were different than I was and were having different experiences. And, uh, sometimes I was able to learn from those people. Sometimes they helped me learn from my mistakes. And I, I just, I eventually came to see that not everybody was experiencing, this country, this community, the workplace, the same way that I was, um, and that I had some obligation to, to do some work around that, I guess, is, is my best attempt at a short answer. All right. Well, I, you know, I think it fits this conversation, especially the not everyone experiences life, though, the way I experience life, the way you experience life. And we're, we're all facing different things. We're all facing different challenges. And as we we're talking about before I hit record here, one of the things that I'm I'm a little fascinated by right now is that, well, you know, there's so many people over 50, and yet there's like almost no instruction on how to do this phase of life well that I've come across anyway. Maybe it's out there. And yet it's a period of life that it feels like it would really benefit from some instruction and some some thoughts on how to approach it. Because um, I don't know, there's just so much going on. You know, when I think of changes just in midlife, kind of the laundry list I have is, you know, friends and family die. You know, we start getting older, people we know start passing away. We, we drift apart from people that we knew, we get busy. Um, people are having different experiences. You know, I, I have friends who are retiring at 50. I have friends who 
are not retiring either because they have no interest in it or that's just not going to happen in their world. You know, they, sure. will, they will work till the day they die. People move, people change jobs, you know, people split up, they move apart. You know, when you're young, you have friends as individuals. And then when you get married, you have friends as a couple and then, but couple split. And there's just a lot of change that, I mean, we think about change affecting the young, but I don't think we think about change affecting midlife. And Joe, you know, one of the reasons I reached out to you and excited about having you on is you had a post about just kind of this, well, it, is more, it, it was not a simple thing. It was mental health. It was loneliness. It was connection. And I wanted to talk about that because that seems kind of like a big thing that affects a lot of us. I think it is. I think it's a, it's a huge thing. I think, um, and, I, and I think COVID has made it a, even a much bigger thing. It's, it's amplified some underlying dynamics. One, one of the first times I came across someone that was kind of talking about this issue that you're addressing, there's a book called, I think it's called Failing Upward, and it's written by uh, Richard Rohr. And um, I found that book at, at the right time in my life, and I think a friend recommended it to me. But he, he kind of, I think this was the first place I heard it, but he kind of makes the point that there is some support and some instruction and some guidance for the first half of your life. And, and that's a pretty busy half, right? You start your career, you start maybe a family for people that do that. You buy a house and you're busy with that stuff. And then you get that stuff behind you. And a lot of people aren't really intentional about, so what is the rest of my life going to be like if I'm not chasing career, if I'm not chasing status, family, those kinds of things. Um, but I think, you know, for me, um, at this point in my age, things like relationships and community and connection have come top of mind and, and partially because of some of the changes that you mentioned. And I think uh, the post you're referring to, I talked about the fact that in the past two years, I had a, a marriage that ended um, and uh, lost my father uh, to suicide. Two pretty big changes. And um, one of the things that, that that stuff kind of made me aware of was that I, and I think this is true of a lot of men, and, and not exclusively men, but I think it's true of a lot of men, don't have a lot of... Um, really open, honest, candid conversations where you can, you know, I, I don't think men are as good at getting together and saying, I'm lonely, I'm scared, I'm hurting. I don't think they're as good at saying those things to each other as many women are. Um, and I think there are consequences to that. I, I was kind of shocked to discover that suicide rates are the highest among men my age and older. And, um, and, and I wouldn't have assumed that on my own, but I but I probably should have. I actually know a number of men that have that have ended their lives, but it was for some reason it was it was counterintuitive to me. And there's I've come across a number of of articles and studies about how things like loneliness and depression, depression and violence and suicide are kind of spiking uh, among middle aged men and older. And I think you know you you layer COVID and quarantine and isolation on top of that, and I think we. We probably have a, a mental health crisis that we're not even fully aware of across gender and age and, and demographic groups uh, in this country. I think it's been hard on people in a lot of different ways. But I think I think you're spot on. I think there's a lot of unaddressed issues in there. And, and one of the things for me is is I, I think we need to do a better job of of men talking to men about this stuff and and having relationships. And I'm not saying we can't still have beers together and talk about football and all that stuff, but like emotion is a real thing. We have emotional needs. Um, we need to be able to process and express those emotions. And if, and if we can't do that in our friendships, I, you know, I, I'm afraid there's not a lot of other places we can do that. And if, if you don't express that stuff, if you don't process it and express it, if you just swallow it or deny it, I don't think it just goes away. I, I think that stuff gets malignant. And I think that's why you have things like depression and violence and suicide and, you know, a few days ago, we saw some crazy stuff happen in this nation's capital. And I think that's another way that this stuff manifests. Um, I'm going to diagnose some people I've never met, and that's problematic. But I think some of those angry men that we saw, I think they are lonely and disconnected. And they've bought into a fictional movement with a fictional leader because I think it's giving them a sense of community and a sense of purpose. So I, I think the underlying things that we're talking about manifest in a lot of ways, but they're all negative. They're, they're negative. And um, I think there's, I, I think this is a pretty big chunk of work. And if we don't address it, sorry, I'm, I'm talking a lot, but if we don't address it, I think we're going to see more and more negative consequences because of it. And it's not exclusively a male thing, but I think 
I think it's more prevalent among men than it is among women. And I think, you know, part of that is about what we teach people about being women and what we teach people about being a man. You know, I've, um, as I look around and I think you're spot on there about the idea of, you know, we need community, we need sense of purpose. And if that's missing, people find it somehow, somewhere they, they seek it out and they find it. And the internet's made that really possible. And that's one of the awesome things about the internet. One of the things I love, um, you and I are connected because the internet exists and yet it, it doesn't always work out well. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we don't always connect with with the right folks, but you know, even just a couple of thoughts come to mind because, and I'm basing this off social media, so this is a very skewed, <laughs> limited sample size. But as I look around, especially when we think about over 50, I see communities for women over 50, like cheering cheering each other on, coming together, celebrating life. I don't come across any of those for men um, mm. at at all. And, um, and maybe I just haven't found that corner of the internet yet. You know, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it isn't as prevalent. And I've also been told that, you know, kind of for many women and, and, you know, I hate to over, over generalize, but, uh, you know, once the kids are moved out, there's almost a a freeing sense of being able to focus on self that that's never been there before. And, and I've never seen that addressed for, for men. And, and I'm not trying to make this discussion solely about men. It's just what I'm experiencing. I know it's what you're experiencing and seeing, you know, yeah. If, if yeah. It, and so, but you also mentioned that and it, it runs deep. Some of it is societal expectations, just what we're taught. Cause when you talk about saying, you know, I'm lonely, I'm scared, I'm hurting. Yeah. From my experience, that's something guys generally don't say to each other. Right. Right. I, I have a few, I have a few uh, male friends that I can have those kinds of conversations with, um, and, and you probably know who some of those guys are. But most of the friendships that I have, that are very candid and very authentic and very safe and very supportive, most of those friendships are actually with women. Um, I, I just think, and I don't think it's something like in male DNA, but I think it's it's largely what we're taught uh, growing up as boys and as girls. I was taught at a very young age that emotions were at best a distraction. And I was taught that by my father, right? Um, who at that point in my life was almost the voice of God. So I had no reason to doubt that. And I tried to live that way for a long time. And I would say there are profound and negative consequences to trying to live that way. Um, as much as we maybe don't like them, as much as they are maybe inconvenient, like emotions are real. And as I said earlier, if you deny them, if you numb them, if you swallow them, I think that all leads to very, very bad things. And I think that one of the differences in how we you know, perform gender or teach gender is um, it's much safer and easier and expected for um, girls and women to express their emotions. It's different for men. Like men can express a couple of emotions, like anger. I can be angry. Um, I can be horny. I can be confident. Other than that, like that's about it. I certainly can't be sad. I certainly can't be lonely. I certainly can't cry. Um, I think it's getting better, but you know, when most boys cry, someone is going to tell them that boys don't cry. And a lot of times they're told that by a male, um, you know, father figure or role model. And, and, and like, I don't think those people are trying to do evil things. I think, you know, they're, they're just going on these traditional expectations, but I think, like I said, I, I think there are profound consequences to those messages, regardless of where they come from and regardless of what the intentions behind them are. I mean, certainly, I mean, we're, we're going to have emotion and not be, not knowing how to process it doesn't seem like a good life skill. Um, no. And, and yet, as you also mentioned, no one's really teaching us how to process them or, or talk right. about it. So right. when it's guys not having many male friends, they can talk to about that. And, and I don't know that there's one right answer, but is that just, is that competition? Like, I don't want to admit weakness to someone else. Is it, um, I just don't know how to talk about weakness with someone else. 
I think it's probably some of both of those things. Um, I think it's probably some of those, again, if you've, if growing up, you did express emotion and someone told you to get back in your boy box or your man box, like, like I think, I think that becomes pretty deeply ingrained. So um, you, you, you don't have a very healthy relationship with emotions. You don't see emotions as a good thing. You don't like reflecting on them. You're not used to sharing them. Um, you're, you're fearful of sharing them around other men because that might put your manhood or your masculinity or your toughness in jeopardy. I think all of those things play a role in it. And, you know, I think, um, I've, I've done quite a bit of work in the past couple of years, but I'm a 52 year old man. I would say I'm like maybe a 30 year old emotionally. And, and a couple of years ago, I was like probably a 12 year old emotionally, just because, I was taught that stuff wasn't good. And so I turned it off and denied it and swallowed it for most of my life. And I'm playing catch up. And, and again, this is not true of all men. I know men that have tremendous emotional intelligence and they're very sincere and authentic and they don't have a problem with vulnerability. But in general, I don't think this is something that men are good at. And I think I don't, I don't think you can separate that from male violence and male suicide and male depression rates. I don't, I don't think you can separate the two. I think they're I think they're part of the same thing. Well, and especially when, when we were growing up, when we were learning how to process this stuff, I mean, you know, that was a different era. My, my, our sons are learning yes. something different now, hopefully. Um, and I, I would agree that, you know, what I was taught was not out of anyone trying to do me harm, but that was the way to succeed, at least what was perceived right. as the way to succeed. And right. And we also know how tough it is to learn something new once we're no longer kids. Like taking on a language now is really difficult compared to, you know, when you're seven and just learning language right. anyway. Um, it's much easier. This isn't for, just learning language. This is part of your identity, you know, right? part of your identity. If, if an important part of your identity is being a man and you've got these certain beliefs about what it means to be a man and you've had them for 30 or 40 or 50 years, this is this is no small thing. Uh, that we're talking about. And, and um, you know, I, I've been kind of noodling on this quite a bit for the past two years. I, I don't know what the solution is. I think there's probably a lot of solutions, but I think at the very heart of it is, is men coming together and having different kinds of conversations with each other. But there's, there's gotta be some openness to that. And, and even there, I think there's a lot of folks that, um, that aren't open to it, that aren't resistant to it. And so I don't know, um, I think it's kind of hard to think about how to reach out to those folks sometimes. Yeah. So, I mean, so you, t I mean, I was thinking just, so if I haven't learned this, it's harder to learn now. I have less experience. I try to learn it now, even though I know it's important, that's hard, but, but you also mentioned that it's not just a skill, it's an identity piece. It, yeah. You know, that that's much different. Picking up a new skill is just a new skill. I learned something, but changing how I think of myself as a person and the <laughs> values that I think make me successful. Um, that's a little harder. That's it a is. lot harder. It is. Yeah. And I think, you know, there, there's a lot of people, you know, when we talk about identity stuff, there's a lot of people that say, well, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, like, I don't care about that. And I think the reality is that in, in our culture, in our society, those gender norms and gender expectations are so deeply ingrained. I think a lot of that stuff we pass on without even thinking about it. Like, do you, do you buy blue coat clothes or pink clothes for your baby? Like that's, that's automatic. It happens without even thinking about it. What kinds of toys we buy uh, for children? Um, automatic, like no thinking involved in it, but it sends all of these messages and it's connected to these expectations and, you know, when it's something that starts that early on, I think, again, it, it becomes for a lot of people very, very deeply ingrained. Having the emotional intelligence, having the skill set, not just the intelligence, but the skill set to have these conversations, to reach out. Also at a time where I suspect we have fewer and fewer people around us who we, we know well enough to reach out to um, or I guess maybe the people we do know though it's such an established relationship that maybe that wouldn't work. Like the relationship doesn't work mm. that way. Mm. Mm. And yet, and I, I, I'm not even sure what my question here is, Joe, I guess I'm <laughs> trying to process all that we're talking about here. Like that, that sounds very daunting and, and maybe, maybe, maybe the solution is more, more friends who aren't male, you know, <laughs> more, more people, more friends who aren't like us in, 
um, it's easier to talk about things that are different with someone who's, you know, doesn't have the same wiring and the same life experience that, that we have. Um, Mm. I, I don't know. Yeah, I think there's I think there's a few different layers to it. One of the things that I didn't do, you know, you talked about those two halves of life and and earlier in my life when I was a young professional and I was kind of starting off, I had very active social life. I had lots of friends. I had different groups of friends. And then, you know, I got really busy. I started a business, I started a family, it was buying a house and my social life really kind of atrophied. I just didn't do a good job of staying connected. Now, some of those friends are still there and some of them will always be there, but the the, the number of relationships that I had was greatly diminished, um, you know, over the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. And so I didn't have as many people around me. And I also didn't have uh, some of the right kinds of relationships. And I don't think every relationship you have or every friendship you have is going to be a big, deep profound, laugh together, cry together relationship, but for sure you need some of that in your life. And, 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 and maybe it's not even friends. Maybe it's, it's a therapist. Another, I'm a, I, I think everybody should have a therapist. And I, this is another place that I see middle-aged men are pretty resistant to that idea over generalizing a little bit, but in my experience, pretty resistant to that idea, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a, a, a faith leader, whether it's a friend, whether it's a anonymous stranger, um, I think um, even if it's just sitting down, being able to sit down with yourself and journal and reflect on your feelings, also a skill set I don't think a lot of people have. I think that stuff is so incredibly important. But uh, but if you go 30 or 40 or 50 years of your life without doing it, it's as you kind of mentioned, it's, it's pretty daunting. It's almost a foreign language uh, that we're talking about. And again, a lot of these things aren't seen as strong, tough, kind of manly things. Um, and and some of that is changing, but I think some of those, you know, pretty strong stereotypical expectations are still there. I think part of it, you know, I think we all have an opportunity to teach boys different things and to role model different things um, about feelings and about friendship and about ways to express and, and process emotions. I think, you know, media is something that plays a role. Um, there's a lot of different pieces to it. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that you and I could do is we can try to, you know, try to make sure that we're showing up uh, a certain way with our male peers and inviting some of those conversations and showing some of that vulnerability. And even if even when you know it's good, it's still it's still a hard thing to do. But I think uh, the more people that are exposed to it, probably the better. Man, I, I, my, my head's kind of spinning here. You know, on, on one hand, it sounds like so impossible. Um, you know, just for everything we, we've laid out here. Um, and on the other hand, you know, it's a conversation. Like we've, we've all had conversations that that, that is not a foreign skill set. Right. Uh, we, we've all built friends, friendships and relationships. And, you know, as you mentioned, it, it, it doesn't even have to be as tough as, as finding, going out and finding a new best friend. I mean, you know, nope. you, you mentioned therapy, faith leader, sitting quiet with a journal, um, kind of, kind of trying to process, um, and, and I, you know, I, I, I guess it doesn't have to be a deep dive immediately. You know, <laughs> these conversations come out over time. It doesn't. And, and, and even, you know, even just paying attention to the relationships that you already have, the, the video post that you mentioned earlier, kind of the point I was trying to make was that for almost the entire year before my father took his life, I was thinking about mental health for men. It had never occurred to me to have that conversation with my father just like it never occurred to me that he was in crisis. Um, and I think, you know, there's help out there. And a lot of us say positive things about asking for help. Some people aren't going to ask for help. And I think that if we just do a better job of, of sharing our own story and, and making it safe for people to engage in that conversation, that might have a pretty profound impact there. And it's hard to talk about the times when you've been lonely, when you've been sad, when you've lost hope. But I think it, again, I think it's actually good for you to process that and own it. And it might just let someone else know that they're not the only one. It might give them example of what talking about saying out loud in public, what, what loneliness is like. Um, even if it's that, you know, sharing a little bit of your own experience in your existing relationships, you know, I think you never know what the ripple effects of that might be, because I think what I, you know, what I've come to believe is that everybody in our circle, in our life, there are some people that look fine on the outside, but are not fine 
on the inside. And so just making, normalizing this conversation, making it as easy for them to enter it as possible, I, I think that might be a pretty big deal. I, I think so too. And, and you mentioned so, something there, Joe, just the, the idea that, you know, you're not the only one and that's so easy to forget. I mean, I, I, I've, you know, you see this come up even in, in very completely different contexts, but like trainings, you know, professional development trainings, you know, there, there's always kind of like, I always hear people say things like, oh, I thought it was only me who experienced that. And you know, it's something so benign that yes, no, as managers, we've all had difficult employees. As employees, we've all had managers we hated, you know? And there's, you just see the power when people go, oh, I thought I was the only one, you know? It's just so freeing to find out I'm not this oddball that <laughs> it's a human struggle I'm experiencing. And what we're talking about is of course, much, much deeper and, and uh, more profound. And I think as you, I suspect, as you kind of go down that loneliness tunnel, um, it's probably a spiral. I, I mean, I'm just imagining, you know, you isolate yourself and then isolate and isolate more and more and more. And it's easy to miss that other people are isolated too, especially I guess the nature of it, because if you're isolated, you're not telling everyone that you're isolated. <laughs> like, right. Right. I think it is a spiral. And I, and I think it's easy to think that you are the only one. There's no possible way anyone could understand this craziness that's in my head or in my heart. Um, and, and I do think it, it's a spiral. And, I, you know, I just, I look back at some experience, you know, you said it was, I think you said liberating to know that you're not the only one. I look back on a couple of really hard times in my life. One was losing my father to suicide when people, people were very supportive and incredible, but there was people that I hardly even, in fact, there were some people that I didn't know at all that reached out because they'd had that same experience. And that's mm -hmm. like, a, you know, they can reach out and connect to you. And that, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a heartbreaking, dark thing, but to share it with someone who knows exactly or has a real idea of what you're going through is kind of amazing. When I was married, uh, we had a, a miscarriage. And again, people that I hardly even knew reached out in very profound ways because they had had that same experience. They knew some of what it felt like. Um, I think when you're, when you're lonely and you've lost hope and you feel like you're what's wrong with the world, I think it's really easy to believe that no one could possibly understand this. Um, and that's why I think we've got to try to surround people with those stories. We've got to, we've got to, like, it's super prevalent. Like, I, I, I wouldn't say that everybody has had those feelings, but I think a lot of people have had dark nights. Um, it's, it's far more prevalent and more normal uh, than we think and um, than we share. And, and again, especially among men, I think, I think men just don't, share those stories. Just since I posted that video, I've had a number of men reach out to me and say, yes, I haven't told my story. Um, and I'm going to try to share it now. And, um, I think there's, I think there's a lot of power in that. And I, sorry, I keep saying the same thing, but I think it's, I think it's a big deal. Well, I, I think so, Joe, you know, um, you're right. We don't talk about things. And when we don't talk about them, it is easy to miss how prevalent they are. So miscarriage was a great example. Um, you know, my wife and I had had two miscarriages and in, in two, two different uh, times in our life. And from, from all that you hear about it, I would have assumed that, you know, it was this very, very rare thing, like, right. you know, never happens. Um, sure. It's in the realm of possibility just doesn't come up that much. But then once, you know, you've experienced that, yeah, you start talking to people and, near as I can tell, it happens a lot. <laughs> and, a lot. Yeah. and, you know, and I think we can choose any kind of dark place in life about that. You know, suicide's the same. We probably have better numbers on suicide. I was not aware that, you know, I'm more likely to kill myself now than when I was younger. Um, right. But, you know, it's just, so we don't talk about it. We don't know about it. We isolate from it. And so, yeah, you know, it's... Um, I, I like the idea of sharing the story. And, and at the same time, while I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, that's, that's what we got to do. I mean, that's also a scary thing. I mean, it for is. all the reasons we've just spent like a half hour talking about. Right, right. And, and you know, this is a great place for a, a Brene Brown quote. You're probably a, a Brene Brown fan as well. But one of my mm -hmm. favorite things is she, she's got a great line about the, the, the connection between, uh, between vulnerability and courage. It's something like, 
you know, the most accurate indicator of actual courage is vulnerability. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think that is an idea that we need to do a better job of delivering to men and boys because cur courage is this thing that has, I think, some real currency with men and boys, but I think it's oftentimes misunderstood. It's, it's, you know, it's the, it's bravado or it's aggression or it's the absence of fear. And, and that's not courage at all. Um, courage requires you to uh, act and stand up in the face of fear, in the face of risk. Like if, if you're going to be a courageous person, when is the last time you chose to exhibit vulnerability? Like a lot of people would struggle to answer that because most of us avoid that because it's scary and it doesn't feel good. But I think there's almost always good stuff on the other side of it. And I think this is an example of that. And, it, and it's not a small ask, asking people to be vulnerable, to, to take some of that stuff that doesn't feel good in their guts and put it out in the world. But I think it's good for them. And I think it's going to be good for other people. I think we need to have a we need to have a better relationship with vulnerability as men. I think that I, I truly believe that. So anything, um, you know, I want to say, how do we do that? And I know how we do that is we just, we start doing that and we, we find the places to, to do it in and build from there. And it is, you know, I come back to a, a skill set there. there I, I believe there is a skill to being vulnerable um, or at least suspect there is. And, willingness and the identity piece. So I, I like that connection back to identity that if I am courageous, that doesn't mean I'm doing stupid stuff that might just have physical harm to myself, but that I'm doing things that potentially have har harm to the other parts of me, you know, mentally and emotionally, right. I've got to be vulnerable. I've got to put myself out there. There's risk right. to it. Someone could reject me. Someone could tell me yeah. I'm wrong. I'm being stupid. They might judge you. Absolutely. All of yeah. those things. Yep. All right. So I, I love this conversation, Joe, and I think it's an important one. Where do we go from here? Oh, uh, gosh, that's a that's a big question. I, you, you know, I, I don't know. I think we, we've we all got different gifts. We probably need to figure that out on our own. I, I know for me, I'm going to find more places to tell my story. I'm going to encourage other people to share their story. I want to, you know, give folks an example of what that looks like to the best of my ability. Um and, um, and I think I'm going to try to find ways to have more conversations about mental health for men and community and connection for men and, and uh, a little bit of a healthier version of, of masculinity. But I think everyone's got a different contribution to make. Um, um, so I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what yours is, but uh, I think that's what mine is. Yeah. And, and maybe from your work in thinking about mental health, is there a is there a good place for people to start? You had mentioned one book. Are there other books, other resources out there that you found helpful? Um, yeah, um, I, I could probably list a lot of books. What one resource I'll share real quickly is the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, AFSP.org. Um, I, I don't know about everyone else. I was not real well educated on the facts and the details of suicide, the prevalence, the rates among different groups. Um, so it's been really helpful for me to get involved with that organization it has a lot of local chapters. So you can get involved in awareness and fundraising and things like that. Um, um, we're kind of off the topic of the Richard Rohr book, but that, that was a really fantastic book for me at that time. Um, one of my favorite authors, and I haven't read anything by her recently, but one of my favorite authors, authors is Bell Hooks. I, I discovered her at a really important time in my life. She's kind of been a Yoda for me, and she's written a lot about race and about gender. And she, she is one of the first people that really kind of made me think about how, um, men kind of do some damage to themselves with this idea of masculinity. We, we, we kind of truncate our identity so we don't have those emotions. She introduced that topic to me a number of years ago. And, and I think um, I would highly recommend uh, just about everything by her, but those are a couple that come to mind. All right. Excellent. Well, Joe, this feels like a, a good place to, to wrap up here. Um, really, really appreciate you being on. Like I say, I think this is a, a crucial topic and I, I appreciate you bringing it up. Thanks for having me, man. Good to see you.